personally salute all frontliners who have worked tirelessly and innovators who have been a solution to prevent and treat COVID-19 and other crisis situations, or an initiative which has contributed towards mitigating the impacts of coronavirus and providing relief to communities. I have observed abundant creativity and innovation emerging at the national, institutional, and organizational, and individual levels for the past year. Now is the ideal time for initiatives like this to be explored, not only encourage development of innovation, but to manage future emergencies and crises. Sejak mencapai kemerdekaan, Malaysia telah mengalami transformasi yang pesat demi kemamuran dan kesejahteraan rakyat. Sektor kesihatan antara sektor terpenting negara sentiasa berhadapan dengan pelbagai isu dan cabaran dalam era globalisasi ini. Fokus Kementerian Kesihatan menjadi lebih luas terutamanya dalam menyediakan kemudahan kesihatan yang saksama, mudah diperolehi dan berkualiti. Untuk itu, perancangan dan pelaksanaan program kesihatan negara perlulah berasaskan kepada bukti saintifik menerusi hasil-hasil penyelidikan yang berkualiti. Penubuhan Institut Kesihatan Negara atau NIH yang bernaung di bawah program penyelidikan dan sokongan teknikal Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia adalah bertujuan untuk menjalankan penyelidikan yang mana hasilnya dapat memberi bukti saintifik terhadap pembentukan polisi dan intervensi bidang kesihatan. NIH telah diluluskan di bawah rancangan Malaysia ke-7 dan secara rasmi beroperasi sejak bulan Ogos 2003. Visi NIH adalah untuk menjadi organisasi penyelidikan kesihatan terkemuka ke arah meningkatkan kesihatan dan kesejahteraan negara. Manakala misi NIH adalah menjalankan penyelidikan, latihan dan perundingan berkaitan kesihatan yang berkesan dan berimpak tinggi untuk meningkatkan kualiti hidup. Selain itu, NIH juga bertanggungjawab untuk mentadbir dan menguruskan penyelidikan di negara ini untuk menangani isu-isu kesihatan nasional. Kompleks NIH seluas 40 eka di Setia Alam Selangor mempunyai ciri-ciri seni bina moden yang melambangkan kerancakan transformasi perkhidmatan kesihatan yang dizahirkan oleh penyelidikan yang berkualiti tinggi. 
Dilengkapi dengan pelbagai fasiliti serba moden, NIH turut menekankan kepentingan ekosistem alam sekitar yang mampu mewujudkan suasana kondusif untuk penyelidikan. Kompleks NIH menempatkan sebanyak enam buah institut yang mempunyai penghususan dalam bidang penyelidikan masing-masing. Kelancaran operasi setiap institut ini disokong oleh pejabat pengurus dan pejabat pendaftar yang menjadi tunjang utama dalam pengurusan strategik dan pentadbiran NIH. Institut Penyelidikan Perubatan atau IMR merupakan institut penyelidikan biomedical tertua di Malaysia yang diwujudkan sejak tahun 1900 oleh kerajaan British. Ketika itu, ia dikenali sebagai Institut Pathology di Kuala Lumpur. Hasil penyelidikan IMR telah banyak menyumbang kepada pengetahuan, pemahaman, rawatan dan kawalan beberapa penyakit tropika utama di negara ini dan rantau Asia Tenggara. Kini, fokus IMR juga kepada penyelidikan bioperubatan seiring dengan tren perubahan isu dan beban kesihatan negara serta kemajuan teknologi perubatan. Sejarah Institut Kesihatan Umum IKU bermula di Singapura sebagai Royal Sanitary Institute dan dijenamakan sebagai Royal Society for Promotion of Health RSH yang berperanan melatih inspektor kesihatan dari Tanah Melayu, Singapura dan Borneo. IKU berkembang menjadi pusat penyelidikan epidemiologi dan kesihatan awam yang menyediakan data-data kesihatan penting pembuat dasar dan pihak berkepentingan mengenai prevalen penyakit dan taraf kesihatan rakyat negara ini. Antaranya adalah tinjauan kebangsaan kesihatan dan morbiditi at National Health Morbidity Survey yang dijalankan secara berkala. Institut Penyelidikan Klinikal atau ICR berfungsi sebagai cabang penyelidikan klinikal KKM dan mula beroperasi sejak Ogos 2000. Dengan lima buah pusat kajian yang berperanan menggerakkan kajian-kajian klinikal tersendiri serta mempunyai 36 cawangan di hospital-hospital utama KKM di seluruh negara. ICR memainkan peranan penting dalam menerajui pembangunan dan pengukuhan kapasiti penyelidikan klinikal negara, mewujudkan dan mengekalkan pengkalan data klinikal bagi KKM dan juga mewujudkan kerjasama dengan organisasi penyelidikan tempatan, serantau dan antarabangsa mengenai penyelidikan klinikal. Institut Penyelidikan Sistem Kesihatan atau IHSR ditubuhkan pada November 2002 bagi membantu KKM dalam perlaksanaan penyelidikan terhadap sistem dan pengurusan kesihatan negara yang membantu dalam menyediakan bukti saintifik kepada pengubal dasar dan polisi kesihatan negara mengenai taraf dan kualiti penyampaian perkhidmatan kesihatan kepada rakyat. Institut ini berperanan dalam melaksanakan penyelidikan berimpak tinggi dalam bidang penyampaian perkhidmatan kesihatan negara, melaksanakan penilaian terhadap dasar dan polisi kesihatan dan keboleh capaian perkhidmatan yang saksama dan berkualiti dalam kalangan semua rakyat negara ini. IHSR telah mendapat pengiktirafan antarabangsa dan telah dilantik sebagai pusat kerjasama serantau WHO untuk peningkatan kualiti dan kesihatan. Institut Pengurusan Kesihatan IHM bermula di bawah Institut Kesihatan Awam yang dikenali sebagai bahagian latihan pengurusan. Penubuhan IHM bermula pada rancangan Malaysia ke-6 yang mana ia bertanggungjawab dalam meningkatkan pembangunan modal insan profesional di KKM untuk menghadapi cabaran dalam penyampaian perkhidmatan kesihatan yang berkualiti. Bidang penyelidikan yang dipelopori oleh IHM ialah aspek kepuasan pelanggan, pengurusan sumber manusia serta pemantauan dan penilaian terhadap kualiti perkhidmatan kesihatan negara. Selain itu, IHM turut berperanan sebagai sebuah institut yang menyediakan latihan berkualiti tinggi kepada kaki tangan KKM. Institut Penyelidikan Tingkah Laku Kesihatan IPTK ditubuhkan pada 2005 adalah bukti bahawa bidang tingkah laku kesihatan adalah penting dalam usaha mencapai sebuah negara maju. IPTK bertanggungjawab dalam melaksanakan penyelidikan inovatif dalam bidang tingkah laku, penilaian intervensi promosi kesihatan, kaedah komunikasi kesihatan yang efektif dan komunikasi risiko. Penyelidikan yang dilaksanakan oleh penyelidik-penyelidik di NIH bukan sahaja telah memperbaiki penyampaian kesihatan kepada rakyat Malaysia, namun telah turut mendapat pengiktirafan di dalam negara dan di peringkat antarabangsa.
Way Forward NIH akan terus mengkaji dan meningkatkan kepakaran para penyelidik ke arah menghasilkan kajian-kajian berkualiti dan berimpak tinggi dalam meningkatkan taraf kesihatan dan kehidupan rakyat Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, our next lined up program is a knowledge sharing session. Please enjoy. Hi, good day everyone and welcome and thank you for joining us today. And uh, here we are uh, in NCSM, we are going to introduce our psychosocial services offered by us. So in the first person to introduce this, it would be Haswani and she is the CIS executive uh, for NCSM. Take it away, Haswani. Yep, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, so yeah. Um, first of all, my name is Hazmani. I am the CIS executive uh, at NCSM. Uh, so, you know, what is psychosocial support? So, uh, Cancer Care Today often provides uh, state of the science biomedical treatment, but it kind of fails to uh, address the psychosocial, which is the psychological and social problems that's associated with illness. Um, so, patients usually need support coping with a range of uh, distressing emotions like anxiety, depression, confusion. Uh, and stress can also result in the, a strain in the relationship and financial difficulties and the stress of the physical illness itself. Um, so it's important for patients to receive adequate information and the skills that's necessary to manage not only the illness, but also access to care uh, and the disruption to work, school and family life. So all of the stresses can actually weaken their uh, adherence to the prescribed treatments and uh, affect the cause of their yeah, disease. Um, so psychological consequences of cancer includes uh, distress, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and also demoralization. Um, so I'll introduce how uh, NCSM kind of addresses that. Um, next slide, please, thank you. All right, so uh, we can start first with the Cancer Information Service, which is what CIS stands for. Um, and as the, CIS executive, I kind of like run the service itself. So one of the ways that the general public first comes into contact with NCSM is through uh, CIS, uh, often when they are seeking support uh, and assistance. Um, and, the, and these include uh, patients, caregivers, and also cancer survivors. Uh, they contact CIS mainly through two ways. Uh, so either they can call us in or call into our toll-free helpline or through our email, both of which are on the screen right now. Um, so in this way, they uh, kind of function as the gateway or the relay station for the clients to access our psycho uh, psychosocial services. Uh, and how it usually works is that I would speak with the client, uh, listen to their concerns, and help them to identify the ways in which we can help them. Um, it's not really that uncommon for them to call in very lost and unsure of the kind of help they even need. Uh, so I gather all the information and I sort it out for them and um, kind of help them to identify which of the um, ser services that we offer that's relevant to them. Uh, and then I liaise between the client and our team to kind of arrange uh, for the consultations. So, um, who is it, who do I refer the clients to? Uh, so it's to our in-house, uh, usually it's our in-house psychosocial uh, team. Um, so they will introduce themselves a little bit later in this presentation. So I'm not going to go too much into it, uh, but essentially we have uh, four in-house uh, staff. So there are play therapist, Tita, our counselor, Malini, our dietitian, Crystal, and our clinical psychologist, Kai. Uh, aside from that, we also have our peer support and the resource wellness center, uh, which is run by Adeline here at NCSMKL. Um, so I often refer people to her uh, when they need social support or to speak to someone who have been where they are right now. Uh, another thing client call, clients call in to us for is uh, if they have like medical questions um, either after the appointment or in between their doctor's appointment, because sometimes they 
suddenly come up with questions or they don't understand what was being told to them during the appointment. So in this case, we can actually help them arrange a medical consultation with two of our in-house doctors, um, either with Dr. Son or Dr. Muradi. Um, in terms of innovation, uh, what CIF kind of does is that, so um, right now we've tried something new. So usually we kind of have paper intake forms to get the information and stuff like that. But we've kind of tried starting something recently, which uh, for our counseling and psychological cases, where we've given them a Google form to fill in uh, and the patients can fill it in and then Kai and Malini can check the responses and make appointments with the clients themselves. Um, and this kind of helps to create a shared database of information and helps um, both Kai and Malini kind of get a rough idea of what the client's presenting issues are. Uh, and sometimes things that are people, people are a bit hesitant to speak about verbally, they might have an easier time kind of writing it down. So um, yeah, uh, that's all for my part. I will now pass it on to uh, Kai, our clinical psychologist. Thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Kai. I'm a clinical psychologist from National Cancer Society, Malaysia, and I'm graduated from uh, Master of Clinical Psychology in UCSI. Next, please. All right, so my key area of expertise will be treating clients with depression, anxiety, stress, interpersonal relationship, emotional and behavioral issue, PTSD, OSD, cell development, and personal doubt. And my main approach for uh, treating clients will be cognitive behavioral therapy and solution-focused brief therapy. But sometimes I'm also quite flexible in other therapy, uh, uh, therapeutic approach depends on client needs. For example, acceptance and commitment approach, ACT, person center approach, and gusto approach. So in NCSM, my mood of the delivery, the consultations will be face-to-face -face sessions. Sometimes I will do one-to-one -one, uh, physical sessions, group sessions, and sometimes I will do home visit as well. And for virtual sessions, sometimes I will, I will do Google Meet and Zoom to communicate with the client. And sometimes I do uh, daily consultations to follow up with client too. Next. Okay, so my role uh, as a clinical psychologist is to give assessment and diagnosis. Uh, so like, first of all, I, would, I actually can uh, identify and diagnose uh, certain psychological disorder, for example, depression, schizophrenia, uh, PTSD, OCD, and sometimes I will use psychological tests to see whether uh, he or she fit into the psychological disorder or not. And I also use psychological tests to see their mental health status. And I also provide individual and group therapy to adults of all age. For treatment part, uh, I I'm using a uh, biopsychosocial mo model to formulate individualized treatment plans. I also use a range of techniques, uh, as mentioned before, and therapies to uh, treat mental health disorder. I also work together with clients to explore coping skills and strategy. Next. So in more in-depth, I uh, in NCSM, uh, how psychological treatment can help cancer patients and survival is I sometimes, uh, it's like most of the time, I focus on what the client are most bothered by, maybe their feeling, their thoughts. And also I will try to help them to learn to modify unhealthy behavior that can lead to certain disease and enhance the life of people who have survived or are living with cancer. I also teach them how to uh, relax by using relaxation technique like 478 breathing technique, progressive muscle relaxation, and also do behavioral actions, activations. And I also can help diagnose the conditions or tell more about the ways a person thinks, feels, and uh, behaves using cognitive model. And I also figured out how best to deal with self, relationship, or family issues. Next. All right, so a lot of people will confuse the role of counselor, clinical psychologist, and psychiatrist. So um, actually for uh, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists, we are able to give assessment and diagnosis of certain mental disorder, mental disorder but certified counselor that cannot do so. And for prescribed medication for mental disorder treatment, only psychiatrists can do that. And to treating mental disorder, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists can do that, but certified counselor cannot, uh, but three of us can do uh, psychotherapy, for example, group sessions, one-to-one -one sessions, and for counseling sessions, both in group or one-to-one, -one, uh, counselor and clinical psychology, which is me, can do that, uh, sorry, 
clinical psychologists and psychiatrists cannot do that, but counselor can do the counseling session because normally they deal with uh, day to day issues. But me and psychiatrists are more to uh, treating mental disorder issues. Yeah, so now I'm going to pass to Malini, which is the registered counselor in National Cancer Society Malaysia, to introduce her role. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Malini. Um, yeah, I'm the counselor at National Cancer Society Malaysia. Okay, yes. Next slide. Okay. Um, since I'm at NCSM, my areas of expertise is basically more into providing counseling for individual couples and family. Those are related and diagnosed with cancer. And I also provide training and workshops. And uh, the most important one is uh, to provide support group for newly diagnosed cancer uh, patient and also for their caregivers. I work closely with Kai into this. And my areas of interest is basically cancer and palliative. And um, of course, it is uh, challenging. And I also look into stress, coping issues, and peer relationship. Besides that, I also uh, handle uh, relationship issues, grief, personality development, marriage, and family issues as well. Here, I would like to emphasize on my main approaches. Okay, my main approach is like, um, I focus on emotional focus therapy, which is EFT, and solution focus uh, brief therapy. Uh, here, I would like to say that um, people with cancer basically just need someone to talk about uh, what they are going through and how they are coping with okay and of course they need someone who are not a relative or friend but someone who is can give empathic uh, listening with understanding and uh, support so in this way emotional focus therapy basically focus on what about their worries and how we can assist them to deal with their emotional thing okay so next slide Okay, my role here as a counselor, of course, I provide uh, uh, counseling, which is like face-to-face -face session, teleconsultation. We do assist uh, with group session as well. Okay, and I conduct intakes and monitor individual groups and family therapies. Here, when I say conduct intakes, we, I also emphasize on assessment, which is DAS21, depression, anxiety, stress uh, score. Okay. And uh, we develop services plan and conduct review as needed through the duration of treatment. We will look into what is the need of a patient. According to their needs, I will plan accordingly my interventions. Okay. I also provide mental health. Uh, sorry. Okay. I also provide mental health assessment, counseling, referrals. This is where referral, I, if it is a, a cases which, which need to look into, uh, about depression and uh, other psychological issues, I will do a referral to uh, my colleague, uh, Kai. And yeah, this uh, mental health assessment, of course, it will encourage clients to discuss emotion and experiences and help clients to define their goal, plan action, and gain insight. And of course, it's develop therapeutic processes. Next. <laughs> Okay, when we are here at NCSM, of course, we look into the uh, challenges. What are the challenges faced by those affected with cancer? We work closely, we journey with our survivors. So uh, when it comes to uh, challenges, the few things that we will always look into is uh, the main challenges will be the uh, physical issues. And of course, the second one will be the uh, psychological distress, social issues. Next. Okay, yeah, how counseling help cancer patient and survivors, how counseling services here, and how I'm helping my patient and uh, my uh, client. First, uh, of course, learn ways to cope with cancer diagnosis and feel less overwhelmed and more into control. I help them to explore what cancer experiences means to survivor and caregiver. Okay, I also assist them manage cancer symptoms and treatment side effect. I usually, uh, we will guide them. I work closely with my peer support uh, coordinator, Ms. Adeline, like to guide them what will be the side effect, how to cope with it. Okay, because this will come into the pain, the anger, the frustration, all, all kind of emotion. And of course, I address relationship issue the moment they have been diagnosed. Uh, there will be some hiccups with their uh, family members as well. 
So we will try to identify that. And we discuss with survivor or caregiver concern about what comes after finishing treatment. Okay, and the last, last one, we also learn how to help a survivor or caregiver family understand and adjust to changes in their routine. Next. Okay, thank you so much. Now I will pass uh, this to my colleague, uh, Crystal, for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Malini. Yeah, um, so um, yeah, my name is Crystal. I'm the dietitian of National Cancer Society of Malaysia. Basically, what I'm doing here is I will focus on the patient's who have malnutrition problems, actually not really malnutrition sometimes, sometimes when they have like any food meat or like any things they want to know more about diet, I will, yeah, I will actually discuss with them. So, okay, so what we provide. So when we, pro when we talk about the nutrition and dietetic service, we can categorize into two groups. We provide counseling and also therapy. What is under counseling is we provide one-to-one -one service. So uh, sometimes we, we, we talk directly to the patients, yeah, or we can actually do a group sessions. We will gather all the patients with similar cancer types, then we will talk about the, the diet and discuss di discuss in a group. So when we talk, when we give diet therapies, we will we will provide tube feeding support because for certain patients, like for example, head and neck cancer patients, when they are not able to eat, most of the time the doctor will put the put on the rice tube. So when the patients on rice tube, we need to provide we need to provide sufficient energy and proteins for the patients through the tube. Yeah. Other than that, for certain patients, like for example, sometimes the patient is not stay at the, at the hospital, the patients actually go to go to daycare and go to daycare and receive treatments. And then sometimes patients actually discharge from the hospital and the patients is under palliative care. So when the patients go back to home or actually stay at home, we will actually provide uh, nutrition and diet plans for them. And then uh, how do we conduct or how do we carry out our role? We were based on our nutrition care process. This process is actually a framework for the dietitians to customize the care and take into account the patient's needs and also values. And also, we will we were use, we were use the best evidence available to, to, uh, to treat, to manage the patients and to make decisions in the aspect of diet. So, um, yeah, this nutrition care process includes four steps. We have assessments. We collect and record the patient's, patient's food history, what the patients normally eat during treatments or after treatments. And then uh, we gather patients' blood results because there are certain markers or certain values that actually related to the food. Yeah, we also ask about the medical tests and the process, procedures that the patients are going through. And we also ask about the patient's weight, the patient's weight trains, and also their weight status, yeah, like BMI. Other than that, we will also look into patients' nutrition-focused physical findings. Those signs and symptoms or side effects that caused by treatments and related to nutrition, for example, difficulty of swallowing. We will take note on that and then we will make the diet diet interventions accordingly. Other than that, we will also look into the patient's history. Like for example, who is the who is the meal preparer, preparer for the patients? Yeah. Next, after gather all the information, we will we will identify the problems based on the data or information that we have gathered. After that, we will provide the plans that directed to the cause of the nutrition problems. And we will also aim to relieve the side effects that the patients are having. So next, after giving the interventions, we will monitor the patient's progress. We will see whether the patient has achieved or making progress towards the goal that we have set with patients. So this is the role of the nutrition in cancer care. Once the patient's diagnosed with cancer, we will prepare the patients for the cancer treatments. Yeah, because nutrition is actually very important 
if we if we manage to get the patients get sufficient nutrition before before the treatments, actually the body can get ready for the for the treatments, and then the side effects of the treatments were less obvious. So when the patients started the treatments and during treatments, we will ensure that the patients has reach the optimal nutritional status so that the patient is able to complete the entire treatments. So after treatments, after patients completed the surgery or chemotherapy, we want to make sure that the patients recover well. So the, when once the patients recover fully, we, will, we can get back, we, we can help them to get back to their normal life. Otherwise, they will have a lot of complications and then they will go into the hospital again and again. So it will affect their quality of life and also the, the length of the life. So after, after patients um, recover from cancer or treatments, we want to support the patients to live in the long term. So this is where we, our role here, we will, we, will, uh, we will suggest the patients what to eat to keep them healthy and to maintain a healthy weight so that it can help to reduce the risk of recurrence. And this is actually the roles of nutrition, nutrients delivery. Of course, we want the patients to get the nutrients from the food or from the normal meal. But sometimes because of the side effects of treatments, the patients are unable to eat or take sufficient nutrients. So we will, we will suggest the patients to take oral nutritional supplements like the, like the uh, nutritious drinks that normally we get from the pharmacy or we normally provide to the patients. Yeah. So this these products actually undergo clinical trials, so it's safe for the patients to take it and it's effective for the patients to maintain their nutritional status, especially during treatments. But if the patients cannot achieve 50% of the requirements due to, due, to, uh, due to the side effects of treatments or sometimes like uh, they, are, they, they, they are not able to reach the requirement after so many trials, then we will suggest the patients to go to hospital and then the doctor will put on the tube feedings either, uh, either from, the, from the nose or directly through the stomach. Yeah. So uh, if the patient's digestive system cannot function well, then we will opt for the parenteral nutrition where the nutrition will go directly into the bloodstream. And here, in, in National Cancer Society, we do recipe modifications because sometimes patients are able to eat sufficient food, especially like rice, noodles, when they are undergoing treatments, they, they, have, um, they, they have no appetite to eat or they have injury at the throat area, then we will, yeah, we will do some modifications where we use the milk to come up with the jelly or we can use the milk to, to make cookies so that the patient has more appetite to eat. And other than the physical sessions, actually we do virtual sessions also because sometimes patients are actually not able to come over and then especially during the pandemic time, I think, I think we have also switched to virtual sessions. We do WhatsApp video call and then we do, we do Zoom and Google Meet. And until now also, we still carry out these sessions, virtual sessions, because uh, some of the patients, they are very, very weak. Their white blood cells is very low. That's why uh, we do virtual sessions to limit or to lower down the exposures to the infections. Yeah. We do, uh, we actually do Zoom for the cancer support group, and we also do Zoom for the family sessions. Sometimes, like for example, the patients actually staying at the at Joho, yeah, and then the the daughter actually working at KL. So we do Zoom or bus video call to carry out the family sessions. Okay, I think I have done my part. I will pass to play therapist Sita. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm a play therapist in National Cancer Society. Um, and what I'm gonna explain here is actually to see um, to see the session or to see play in a different form of play. So we'll go beyond play, yeah. Uh, next, please. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, what is play therapy actually? So for many of us or most of us that we see play, we always think it's something fun. It's something that the kids will just do like, you know, in terms of being silly or just having fun. But play actually has a very profound meaning to it because it's based on a non-directive way and non-interpretive interpretive and judgmental way of supporting the children or even the young adults and our adolescents in heightening the state of their vulnerability. So basically what we look here is that the toys that they are using is actually their words and the action, the play that they are, they are doing, it is the language that they are actually trying to communicate and to show what is actually the underlying message that they are trying to show to us. Okay, uh, next please. Okay, so now there is a difference between the counseling method here actually for kids because kids are not like adults where they can easily verbalize how they're feeling. So they tend to verbalize either by showing a tantrum or going into a meltdown mode or, you know, or just being very quiet, which is, you know, very concerning for the parents and also everyone around them. And that is why for kids, we actually use this medium. So we will have a lot of mediums that we're using from sand to clay to water to painting to musical instruments, everything, even puppets and also that they use that third medium to actually show what they want to communicate. So, it, and it's also, it's another way to, to better self-regulate themselves, especially for kids who are diagnosed. Before they get diagnosed, they are going through a but maybe that period of time where they are not feeling too good, they can't do things that the other kids are doing out. The moment they get diagnosed is that they are ready, you know, their whole childhood has changed, that they, they have to spend down that time in the hospital. So they are not going to school, they are missing out on their, their, their education, they are missing out on making friends, meeting their friends. So their new life now is it's in the hospital, getting educated in their sickness and also being friends with the doctors and nurses and the therapists there. So hence they have a lot going on inside uh, underneath them, the uncertainty, the fear, the, the basically the trauma that they go through is really it's in a very high scale that they do not know how to regulate in that sense. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so here like I said we use a lot of uh, mediums. So we have the cre creative visualization where um, sometimes we just make them to imagine where they are at and this is more for understanding and also thinking. And then of course storytelling, we use uh, metaphor stories to make them understand actually their condition they are in. And also sometimes drama using, um, you know, using role play. Like sometimes they have, uh, we have also like, you know, uh, certain uniforms that they can use to pretend like they are doctors or police or policemen or anything like that. So that they can actually show and, and create a social relationship with others. Then of course with puppet and mask and then art. Art usually are done for, uh, with adolescents because they are more in that sense of expressing their way through writing, through drawing, you know, so they don't use much of like the, the words, the toys that the other kids would be using. Then of course we have dance and movement and also sampling and uh, century where they use the figurines to tell out the story. So these can be in a non-directive method where they can just come in and do whatever they want to do. Or like for adolescents, we actually give them a directive mode, like we give them a title of, okay, today you're going to talk about your friends. So the theme today will be about your friends. So let's do a send, uh, a send play with, with that in the figurines. So uh, we are using the creative media by not talking. Why? Because children, whatever they are saying, it's only seven percent is coming through their words. Okay, and it is just very superficial answers when they give. But what here we are focusing on? We are focusing on their their voice and their tone and their facial expression and the body gesture. So as you can see in this, uh, we look at them like an iceberg. What we are seeing on top is the superficial thing that they are showing and, you know, we tend to get, oh, why are they behaving like this? The behavioral problem comes in. But because of that, you actually, there's something going on underneath there. So they are basically like an iceberg. Okay, uh, next please. 
Okay, so how do we know play therapy works? If we have this uh, strength and difficulties questionnaire that we use, and it measures the total difficult terms of the emotional symptoms, the conduct problems, the hyperactivity, and the peer relationship problems. And there is one that we also can include, uh, it is the strength of their poor pro-social behavior. Next, please. So this is how the form will look like. So it will be given to the parents as well as the child. And the child will be taking it, it's about them, and then they'll get a score from there. So if the score is more than 20, the child is in a severe mode of getting the help individually. But if the score is less than 20, we try to get a group activity session for that child because it could be that the child is only having maybe some peer relationship problem that you will get another child to play with so that they can um, they can actually regulate on that part. Okay, next please. Okay, so now how this helps cancer kids uh, play therapy, like I have mentioned before, their whole life has changed. So when we actually bring these uh, two kids to them, yeah, they actually uh, tend to regulate it and tend to actually put it in a physical form. That is whatever that's in their thought, is in their subconscious mind, is in their body, they tend to actually bring it out. So for example, if I'm showing you this, if you can see, yeah, this was done by a 15 year old boy who is no longer with us. And his story in this is actually, he said that this person here is, is in a park and this place you can't find it on earth. And after four weeks, he left us. His, you know, yeah. So basically, this is how play actually works. It goes very beyond of what we want to communicate. And during the pandemic time where we couldn't reach out physically, the physical playroom had to become a virtual playroom where we had to do it online. So this is how we created on getting the kids to actually uh, do the same way, but in the virtual setting. Okay, next please. Uh, then the other mode of delivery is of course group session with the families. And we also give intervention to the family, uh, to the parents especially, so that they get a hint of how to help out their kids at home. And then we also do for the adolescents there. And we also have house session. Okay, house session will be for kids who can't come to the center to get to do the session. So I will actually go there. Like, and also for kids who, where families where they have lost their, that child or that sibling, we will actually go there and actually do that brief session with them. Right? Uh, next, please. Okay, and then to top it off, we also do hospital bedside sessions where, uh, where the kids are admitted there and you know doctors will give us a referral and I will go and see there and you know do that. So it's basically from playing the clay as well, you know, mobile kids that will be taking there. So for kids, they are very much different and they are really, we are actually using this as a psychodynamic theory, okay, where it actually um, favors the unconscious uh, actions and belief that they have, and then they tend to regulate from there. So, yeah, uh, next, uh, yes, so thank you very much for joining us today. And um, of course, feel free to contact our hotline number. Okay, uh, do get in touch with us and get in touch with any one of us here as we all work closely together. Yeah, we actually we do we do the holistic approach for the families and also for the child. And yeah, basically it's a holistic approach for everyone. So do take care and we'll see you again. Thank you.